much. Okay. Thanks for your patience, everyone, and welcome to the Brittle Psychedelics Ritual Regulation and Research. Might not be in that order, but we'll be discussing all things. And my name is Melissa, and I'm the Secretary of Prison, Psychedelic Research of Science and Medicine, a pioneering charity which has actually been involved in Saudi's first MDMA PKSD trial and the first psilocybin trial here in Australia. Yay! I'm also here with two other four members of prison as well. We have Ronnie, who is four member of prison, and also the founder and president of EGA and Three Genesis Australists, which is a knowledge sharing and a community group that has built amazing satellite science conferences for the last 20 years. And Ronnie's going to be speaking about EGA, the opportunities, knowledge sharing, cultivating community, and also the rights and the freedoms we have to explore our consciousness. We also have Lani Roy, Dr. Lani Roy, a psychologist, also founding board member of AMA, Australian Pulp History Association of Psychedelic Practitioners, a group that is helping create regulation um, and direction for the content for cycling therapy here in Australia. Also, director and founder of Science of Life Psychology, which I'm also a part of, psychology group that's helping provide therapy both in the cycling context more broadly, but for providing preparation, integration, training, both to individuals and therapists. Also, have Jake Payne, a PhD student at Swinburne University who is studying the effects of psychedelics in the context of adult development. And we'll be discussing that further a bit later. We have Mark, who is the founder and director and president, executive director of prison, and also involved in many psychedelic trials here in Australia from psilocybin to hydrogen DMT to methylone to empty What? Um, and largely it's Hoburn University. We also have Adam Russell, who is the chapter leader of the Australian Psychedelic Society, a grassroots community hub, which provides support, education, and, and, and connection on a harm reduction level and on a community level for individuals here in Australia who are already, and we're just here, exploring psychedelics uh, in their own enjoyment and connection. Thank you, Adam. So I'm just going to give some context about the conversation we had today. Situate ourselves, where we find ourselves in this bravely world of having regulated psychedelics here in Australia, the first entire country to do that, for MDMA and psilocybin, which is pretty amazing, right? Yeah. Um, so also I just wanted to say that I'm grateful for us being at this panel at Alex Ateric, an event which is foundational for building community for the side lake community and more broadly the creative community here in Australia. And this is a side lake event in itself. And what does what does that mean? You know it's one of art, we know it's one of connection, we know it's one of knowledge sharing, building friendship and experimenting with new ways of being. So the word psychedelic. How many of you know the origins of the word psychedelic? Anyone? Yep. Okay. Right. Okay. So, anyone know Aldous Huxley, author of Bravely World, The Doors of Perception? Shout out Aldous. <laughs> so, in a conversation with Humphrey Osmond, a psychiatrist who, among the two of them, were pioneers exploring these brave frontiers of consciousness and the mind through mescaline. And together they were writing fat little lyrics of what do we even call these compounds, which had opened up new worlds and new horizons, new ideas in their own lives, and they wanted to share and create context for that throughout, fully, throughout our communities, throughout the world. And in a little limerick, Humphrey Oswald said to Aldous Huxley in a letter, to rise to hell, 
or psilocybin, is take a pinch of psychedelic, and thus the word psychedelic was coined. And that's interesting, isn't it? I said how all sorry jelly. We're very much hoping through a ladder that the former does occur. We tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's the individual level. How about the cultural level? Let's take a step back and explore and go back to Aldous Huxley, Brave Well, the island. We're on a, an island here in Australia, pioneering a new way of doing therapy, pioneering new ways to be hoping that that's held in the context which supports healing and the sustaining and then break new world. Culture it does use substances. They have soma, which is a substance that's kind of used to regulate the mind, keep them placid and keep them in their context, not really speak outside the box, refresh, rejuvenate, but also not break free as a saying. A culture is constrained. It's hard to break out of, of the hierarchy you're born into in breaking world. Overly structured. And yet there's the island. The island was Alice Huxley's utopia. Breaking world was the dystopia. And in the island there's communities that are using psychedelics in the form of British. In a sense that regulation Almost isn't even the intellectual voice context, community, connection, having I mean, a grounding in ethics as a culture. The birds are trained to say, be here now, randomly, as I say, soon be it. Um, so that's a utopia. How do we create what's called a protopia in futures? The idea of understanding the dangers that lie before us and not not shutting back, not ignoring, and yet not acting out of fear, building together a sustainable ethical framework to guide ourselves with these therapies. As uh, in, currently in the culture, there's a, a challenge. A lot of money is coming in. What a corporate interest. How do we keep balance between healing, profit, and a future in which we can be proud of? So, to go back to the panel, Bronnie here has been involved in the same like community 25 years plus, um, and has built incredible knowledge sharing systems for our communion. I'd like to go to Bronnie and ask, given this context that we're entering, what are your insights and learnings for the last 25 years and how we can sustainably reflect on those, the issue, or well, the, the history of psychedelic does they have brought us here today for the future? Uh, hi, hi. Um, I'm Jonathan Carmichael, but everyone calls me Ronnie, so that's definitely the way to go. Um, I, I think I talked about this last time, I'm going to summarise it really quickly, and it's, it's a very broad way of thinking about it, but it's good to sort of, one way of understanding sort of the interrelationship between um, sacraments, drugs, and plants, and our culture. Is, is sort of to break it down into a couple of phases. And I'm gonna summarize this very quickly for everyone, so they'll be lucky. One is sort of the First Nations phase, the, the phase where the plants were with First Nations people and they were uh, essentially um, sort of kept as sacred plants and used sacredly in their, in their cultures and religions. And then very phase two, which is around sort of 1800s, 1900s, is, is and, and in well into the you know, the 1900s is, is sort of the extraction phase where uh, I guess the West went out and um, many, much, many times with anthropologists and sometimes in other ways and extracted the, the plants and refined them into drugs. So it's sort of where we, essentially like mining, we went to the First Nations people and the keepers of plants, not in all situations but in many, and we gra got hold of those plants, brought them back into the West and then essentially extracted them and colonized them into our medicine. And then phase three is the phase that we're all most familiar with, which is the war on drugs. It's where, uh, let's just for a crude term, the Westerners have been engaging and using the drugs and then the, the, the powers of B have been very unhappy with that. And then hence the war on drugs, which has lasted, you know, about a hundred years now. And then 
that's and then the final stage or near final stage is sort of the medicalization at a larger degree, especially with psychedelics, and that's the modern time now. So we've gone through the war on drugs. We're still in the war on drugs. All of those stages kind of coexist, but we certainly are sort of more moving into the fourth phase now, which is kind of the medicalization of these plants. And hopefully it's going to be a much more positive sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, I'd say going forward for all of us. Because there are many sacraments that have had traditional value are now being understood medically uh, where there have been a lot of resistance to have value as well. So it's important for us to really uh, embrace the plants like on all levels, but it's great that there is this real pushback that's mainly been done through research uh, to show uh, the medical use of these plants. But uh, for someone like myself, I certainly just see the medical use of plants as just one of the perspectives. There's many, many, obviously. Um, as far as modern culture, and I guess uh, it's like this community, like I've been lucky to be um, in the doofing scene for a good 25 years. Uh, I worked as a photographer and for about 14 years across parties, as well as working on EGA. So I sort of had quite a lot of encounters with the, with the community. Um, I think one thing that's really, really sad is, um, I guess, the over permitting and the uh, the police presence at events like this, because we know that like shopping malls have more weird shit going on. Like, um, you know, we don't need to be policed. We're all very beautiful people, and we've come here to be just that. You know, so I think as far as policing goes, and the like, even this year's better. I haven't seen as much of it. But when you walk around and just see all of these undercovers and they're just looking around trying to make an easy statistic out of someone that's trying to have a good time and not hurting anyone, it's just a disgrace. So I think the, the biggest thing is the, I guess, as we've built and grown these spaces, the powers of B have tried to kind of check that but I, and, and then with their policing. But I honestly think the over-policing now is an absolute sign of the end of the drug war because they're getting desperate. Their over-policing is such a desperate way to get stats to try to convince someone that this, this whole charade is worth having. And it's not. It's a joke. So I think as far as things changing uh, on that level, I would say that over-policing is a big issue. But the community has grown massively. It's so good to see people here. I bump into people I saw 25 years ago. They're looking healthier than 25 years ago. Like that's what you want to see. Um, I think meeting people, having connections, having sometimes put yourself out of your comfort zone and talk to people you don't know. Like my wife hasn't come this weekend, so I've had heaps more conversations. That's not good or bad, but it's, 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 led to, it's, it's led to development in my personal being because I had a great conversation with a guy about grief and my father passing, and that stuff's huge. So coming here, meeting people, and watching this whole community share and share and be gracious and, uh, you know, and just be kind to each other. And it's what we're all here for. So thank you. I, I can only say I see better things over the 25 years in the Doof scene. And I hope that I live the next 25 to see even more of this amazing community. Thanks, Ronnie. And let's sort of pick up that point of taking psychedelics out of their usual context. There was really, a lot, this year, Lani and I traveled to Denver to attend Psychedelic Science, which was the largest Psychedelic Science conference ever. There was 12,000 people. Now, I, but I went to Denise though, and there was maybe a, a water of that. So it has truly grown. One of the comments I found quite fascinating in the talk was by a visual knowledge holder from the Seeking. And they made the point that we've taken cocoa and turned it into cocaine. We've taken um, poppy seeds and turned them into opioids. We've taken, um, what's the term for tobacco? Lopatra. Lopatra. <laughs> and turned it into cigarettes. What will happen? They said, what will you do to Cyberdelver? Another, another fascinating comment was, um, it was a survey or sort of a knowledge collecting exercise exploring what the knowledge holders thought of the word psychedelic. And they reflected back that they felt a more appropriate word would be shindelic. So rather than my manifesting 
community managers. It kind of represents the cultural dichotomy that we are facing between traditional knowledge uh, systems and the individualization of the West. And shifting to the lovely Wani Mia, we do work as a psychologist and as a foundational board member of AMAP. Can you share a bit more about what you are creating there and also with your growing experience as a psych psychologist working both in both community and in trials to provide you more information about how therapy is going to be scaffolded for preparation to integration? Such big questions, <laughs> Angela. <laughs> Great to be here, everyone. Um, I'll start by yeah, acknowledging that I'm, I think I was destined to walk a challenging path of paradox because I'm, I'm a social worker and a psychologist and I, I really support dehumanisation. That's my, my heart of medicine. Um, I'm married to a sexual abuse detective and my, my brother's in the police. Um, and I also am a founding board member of a, a charity that's really focused on re regulating medicines. So, yeah, I guess my roles are quite nuanced in, in that I get to see all those uh, rich environments that are very complex and each have a voice and each have complexities, which is why it's, you know, Trace Valley's panel today with such a strong body of knowledge. Yeah, the work that everyone's done. Um, and it's so important that we listen to each other because medicalisation comes with huge potential, but also huge risks to the environment, to indigenous communities, and also, you know, freedom of consciousness, which should be free and, you know, not deemed by the police. So I agree with you there. Um, so um, AMAC was formed about a year ago as a direct connection to the DGA rescheduling when a small group of us are really passionate, hardworking, rigor of psychedelic researchers and therapists and scientists realised that there was no, uh, I guess, pig body for psychedelic practitioners. So the DGA said go, but there was no framework. You know, who, you is safe to be in the room, you know, at what level, for example, a preliminary therapist to a fully accredited therapist, then a supervisor who can sign off on everyone's work. What makes a course that might be like, accreditable to make it safe within that, that medical model? And, you know, the importance of building a community where we can all support each other, because it's, it's a massive journey being a psychedelic practitioner. A lot of the therapists are on their own personal journey of trauma and healing while they're also studying and learning to be psychedelic guides. So we really need a strong foundation to be able to look after each other, as well as connect with uh, decriminalisation and other organisations. You know, what we've seen go wrong in Australia has been um, you know, potential bad actors or quite aggressive psychedelic actors in the potential for splits in the ecosystem when we somehow need to find a way to have conversation and connect even if we're coming from different paradigms. And just, just acknowledging, although AMAP is focused on deep, uh, sorry, on um, regularisation, we, we want to work with people in the decal space because the majority of our clients are taking psychedelics illegally or going overseas because currently the, the cost for psychedelics is up to between 19 and $25,000 for two doses of MDMA and psilocybin. So it's you know, incredible that we have these uh, laws that have changed, but the reality is that only the, the rich can afford them at the moment and clinics that are quite wealthy already. So my clients can never afford these, um, and that's why I focus more on uh, cannabis and ketamine therapy, which is uh, potentially easier and cheaper and more affordable for for clients. So um, I guess from a preparation and you know integration perspective, AMAP needs to hold that clinical container, but we also have to be realistic from a harm reduction perspective that most, most of our clients at this early stage are going to be sourcing medicines illegally. And how do we work with these organisations so that we have the best knowledge as well as, you know, planned knowledge, not just synthetic medicine. And really scaffold our practitioners to understand that there's a nuance between all these containers 
a solo journey versus a ceremony with a, a curandero, versus medicine in a recreationist space, versus, you know, having a, a psychedelic with a psychiatrist and a, and a psychologist. And one thing I just wanted to note is when the chief health officer um, gave his recommendations for the rescheduling, it was for a clinical psychologist and a psychiatrist to be the only ones allowed in the room. So AMAP's been really passionate and on the forefront of advocating to change that and we've had success in the sense that they've, they've opened it up. To, there has to be a clinical psychologist in the room, but the third space can be up to the discretion of the ethics committees and psychiatrists. And that's where AMAP has come in with this framework to help ensure that our First Nations people be in the space, our peer workers that might have alcohol and drug, uh, the cloma, um, people with lived experience and they've done a you know, certificate of psychedelic therapies. So although AMAP is medicalised, we're trying to decolonise from that perspective that it should be just you know, two, two professions dominating that space because that's not better for work. That's not what it is. That work out that client's need. I could go deeper into privilege duration, but that's what we Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lanyan. Yeah, so it is a, a truly great new world with psychedelic treatments actually occurring in our PD person DMA because the has been occurred recently, the more of one she was sued. And, and yet, when it comes to the research, we actually have a limited body of knowledge precisely of of how to do this therapy well, to face up other conditions. So far, the trial's really focused on MDMA, PTSD, psilocybin, depression largely. So there is still a lot of research and understanding being cultivated to do this well. Yeah. And to speak more on that, I'd invite Martin to share a little bit of the history of what has brought psychedelic research from where he's today. Martin has been pushing for the research to occur for the, the prison. Chris has been around for now nearly 12 years. And we only actually, with that long history of this research trial, we only actually had research at start in 2018. Is that right? Yes, 2018. So that's um, only six, five years ago. I just, six, three years here. <laughs> so Martin, can you please share more about that history? What's happening now in your work? And also, I feel you have some really cut the reflections on both the role of medicalization and what's beyond that. Sure. No, thanks very much, Stens, for having us here. Um, I'm happy to say Jonathan's making me feel like a newbie. I've only been doofing for 23 years. And I, uh, yeah, we met, I think we met about 21 years ago. And that was around the time that uh, Antheogenesis Australis, EGA, uh, was formed. And um, I'll come back to this in a couple of minutes, but... Um, to us, communication and knowledge in the community is really what it's all about. Uh, and so I'm very, very happy to see everybody here. And I hope that you'll walk away from this little talk today um, a little more knowledgeable, a bit more enlightened and a bit more able to communicate with your own sort of community within your own community, which is still ultimately our own community, uh, about all of this work. So. Um, it, is, uh, it has been a very interesting journey. We, um, we realised communication and knowledge were really what it was all about way back in 2004 when EGA was started. Uh, and then we very quickly became uh, more and more, um, I guess, sort of in contact with people around the world who uh, clearly had been coming from the underground but was starting to find ways to bring psychedelics above ground. And so the way that it seemed to make most sense was to find ways to destigmatize and to legitimize psychedelics and and so it, it has to be said that the medicalization was really has been a strategy towards legitimizing psychedelics i think it's frank and reasonable to say that and so the medical the medical side of things is one way of course but the cultural community side of things is another and of course adam and, and jake and as well will be speaking about this i'm sure um, so yeah, from uh, around 2004 to about 2010, we were uh, organising conferences, um, mainly in Victoria, partly in Melbourne, partly in, in country Victoria. And so we were becoming more and more part of the global network. And it was in 2010 that uh, Dr. Rick Doblin, who is the executive director of MAPS, 
uh, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Anyone came over, perfect, came over from the US. They had been, um, they'd been sort of working to initiate research using MDMA-assisted therapy for the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. And so their trials were just uh, getting underway. And he said, well, you guys in Australia, you have a lot of knowledge and not, not a lot's happening yet. Why don't we think about sort of bringing Australia on board? And we took that to heart that very year and, and established PRISM, Psychedelic Research in Science and Medicine, as a way of making an Australian contribution to that global research effort. And uh, although I think maybe, a little, sorry, this fly is very friendly. Um, although we, uh, although we're probably a little ahead of our time, I think we did plant those seeds back in 2011, 2012. Uh, we had good media response all the way through. It did take until 2018 to actually get any research underway. And that was uh, Australia's first trial of psilocybin assisted therapy for the treatment of anxiety and depression associated with terminal illness at St. Vincent's Hospital. I'm happy to say that that study has just concluded after treating 35 or so participants, and I'm happy to say that the results have been absolutely compelling. So we're putting those results together at the moment. Thank you. So um, I think really once the, once the research started to gain some public recognition, then there was a real sort of snowball effect. And through the efforts of various groups and various people, it has to be acknowledged um, there's there's a much much greater awareness in Australia. In fact, there's a there's a there's a huge awareness in Australia now thanks to this broad dissemination of uh, of knowledge and the um, awareness that the Therapeutic Goods Administration has made that uh, rescheduling decision back in February in, in 2023 last year. Now the research landscape is interesting because of course for those people who who regarded research as a way of just getting us over the line and getting us to that sort of um, rescheduling and, and uh, re-regulation process, essentially a legalisation of psychedelics in, in the medical context, then research, uh, to our mind, really still has a part to play because, as far as we're concerned, only a few of the answers really have been achieved to some of the, the really big questions around psychedelics and around uh, psychedelic applications, both in medicine for the treatment of people who have mental health conditions but also what we, what we call the, the betterment of well people. And so many, many people here uh, at, at festivals and events such as Esoteric will be well aware that their, their lives can be enhanced by the judicious and responsible uh, use of psychedelics. And the psychedelic experience can have a huge part to play in our capacity to, to, to take what life throws at us, to deal with the, just the little niggles and problems that we have from day to day. And also for some people, it really needs to be acknowledged that some people probably here at the festival are not in the best mental health chain. And so there's the potential for people to be healed and to benefit from, from psychedelics. Our feeling now is that we really need to explore these other broader questions in the community, as well as the application of psychedelics to strictly well-defined mental health conditions. What we have found in the research done to date is that people are complicated. Has anybody noticed just how complicated people are? And, um, and so we're, we're, we're coming up against, time and time again, we're coming up against the problem of the medical model wants to narrow down people's conditions so that they, they have depression or they experience post-traumatic stress disorder or they have anxiety. But in fact, what we find is that most of us have the whole spectrum across all of these various adult conditions to varying degrees. It's almost like an equalizer and NQ on a, on, a, on a stereo. You basically see you know, some, sometimes the bass is heavy, sometimes the treble and whatever. And, and so um, essentially we find that given the complexity of humanity, we're sort of chasing after this and trying to find ways to, to uh, maximize and optimize the outcomes, minimize the potential for negative impacts. And so that's where I feel that the next few steps in research are really taking place. I'm happy to say that I'm also very closely involved in starting a study um, uh, specifically for studying psilocybin for the betterment of well people and particularly to study the, um, the ecological and nature relatedness, so ecological awareness, environmental awareness, and just to see whether some of these um, uh, hypotheses that have been put forward in the last five years or so, that psilocybin can, uh, the psilocybin or psychedelic experience more generically can actually uh, increase our attachment to the environment and to the world around us. And so we're going to be putting that to the test as best we can in a very small study over the next, uh, the next year or so. 
So anyway, thank you very much for uh, for coming along and for your attention. And I'm right back to Melissa. Thank you, Martin. And I just wanted also to say how grateful I am to have Martin here, someone who has this wealth of experiences to thoroughly launch in terms of research and support of this growing field in Australia. Thank you, Martin. And so Martin touched now the idea of betterment of well people. I'm going to do that for myself as well. Um, and I know many of us here have benefited from the insight from the creative potential, by the opportunities of connection with psychedelics. And it's a question of well, how exactly are they benefiting? What do they actually do to our, our thoughts, our visions, our development of the process of lifetime? I'm sure many of you are aware of the knowledge of, we have this framework for, for example, child development. But how about our development? How about the steps towards greater awareness Loving awareness, wisdom, and it's a feel that is probably growing out of standard with our psychedelics. So, how about the context of psychedelics? This is where I'd like to, to pass to Jake, who is studying the role of psychedelics in adult development, which is very relevant to us all here. So, pass it on to Jake. Thank you, Marissa, and um, yeah, hello, Esoteric. It's great to be here. So, yeah, my topic in my PhD is the, the impact of psychedelics on what's known as emerging adult development. And when I talk about emerging adult, I'm talking about people between the ages of 18 to 30 who are, you know, in recent times, you know, not getting married as quickly as they did in the past. They're not having children as quickly as a pass, but instead going through this sort of longer moratorium period where they are looking at themselves a bit more. They're asking questions. They're asking, you know, who am I and what does it mean to be an adult? What does it mean to be a responsible, good person in the world today? And you know, it, it's in that age group, 18 to 30, that most people do psychedelics for the first time and consume psychedelics at the highest rate. So we've seen huge increases from four years ago, about 5% of emerging adults said they did psychedelics in the last year to now 8% in the most recent survey data. So it's, you know, it's, a, it's, it's when people most do psychedelics and the research also just suggests that it's actually when psychedelics are experienced in the most intense way, meaning that they both experience the, the positive effects such as, you know, the mystical type experiences that are associated with psychological benefit, but also experience the most sort of negative kinds of effects. So... Yeah, so I, I want to caveat by, you know, I think that there's a lot of you know, wisdom in this community and the doof scene about how psychedelics may impact, you know, young people, young adults' development. You know, there might be a lot of common anecdotes you have just from personal experiences or seeing how psychedelics go with other people in your life. But from a sort of scientific lens, we're well behind with that. The, the, the narratives and the stories, there's very little framework or understanding of some of the mechanisms by which psychedelics may contribute positively to the way um, emerging adults develop. And while the, the focus of my research is mainly on how it does better well, wellness in emerging adults, I'm also very interested in you know, how it can go wrong as well. And it definitely can go wrong. It's kind of how I got into this topic because it kind of went wrong for me. You know, I did psychedelics at a do you know, eight years ago and, you know, really didn't understand. There was no ritual or initiation. I didn't know what I was being initiated into and I had to kind of make it up by myself. You know, I was... And I, I, yeah, I took the insights that I got and they got to my head and, you know, I ended up with hair down to my chest, 
looking like Jesus. And, you know, it took me a while to, you know, realize maybe that the psychedelics weren't really telling me what they, what I thought they were and that maybe it was a way for me to escape. Um, and it's been, a, yeah, a bit of an integration coming back to myself. Um, going from, you know, being called Elijah, you know, t changing my name and then changing my name back again to Jake. You know, so I really sort of saw an example in myself of how psychedelics may, you know, throw young person's development off course. And it really got me curious about, well, what are the sort of factors in which it, it, it goes right? And what are the sort of, you know, settings, what are the sort of characteristics of an emerging adult? What, what do they need to have for it to actually go well so that we can understand how to you know, hopefully maximize that in more people in the future and make sure you know, other people don't you know, get thrown off course with psychedelics and they can you know, do it in a grand, grounded way that adds to their life rather than takes away. Mm. Yeah, and so a lot of my research is, is using um, anecdotes and you know, qualitative research. Specifically, I'm asking young, um, young adult men. So people, well, I'm asking men who are between 30 and 36 who use psychedelics in their 20s and thought that that had a positive impact on their life. And I'm asking them to look in hindsight, what was that developmental trajectory? and trying to understand some of the common patterns that we see of you know, when they were using psychedelics, how they were using psychedelics, and how that affected different um, positive adult developmental outcomes. And I'm also using longitudinal study research from a, a big data set in the United States that has been collecting data since 1976 about um, you know, people's drug use and their psychosocial development. So I'm going to be trying to map out different trajectories of you know, patterns of psychedelic use, motivations for psychedelic use, and see how they relate to um, positive adult developmental trajectories. Yeah, that is a good place to end. Let's put... I just want to say that it's related to my own journey. I found psychedelics did truly open me up and they, you know that from research studies that they do increase the personality domain of Oculus to experience, which is a really positive domain in the sense that it's highly correlated with creative individuals, with intellectual pursuits, and yet it's also correlated with increased rates of schizoid personality disorders, phrenia, and other challenges in calling on to reality in a, in a firm, stable way. See, you could a double-edged sword in that way. I love this stuffy quote. Not uh, It's a great to think of my dark food, but makes all your brain start to fall out. So, to me personally, there was this opening, there was this healing, but it was also a bit of getting off track, as what helped me maintain that balance. I was temple practice, meditation, and I believe all that raw research meditation also increases over the Swiss experience. But it also is a tool of discernment. It's a wisdom tradition. It, ha it helps you develop thought patterns, uh, reflective exercises, what we call better cognitive practices, be able to think about your thinking in a way which helps you open your mind to choose the right answer, the right option for you based on your values based on your community, what benefits not the primary intention to develop this practice is every meditation you sit down to. So you go straight to breath, you go, you go, this attention, right to this practice it is how the benefit be kept into my values. And in doing so, benefit both my own path, those I love and those I'd meet along the way. That last sentence is the most important part. Every practice. So reflecting on, and one thing I'll also say, if you think about the way to practice, when we do Vipassana here, there's actually a larger um, number of people who develop challenges doing a meditation um, retreat without the context of community, the sangha it's called in the Buddhist context. So even if you take meditation, the inside lights out, and obviously consciousness meditation, there's greater risks in our culture, our individualized, non-ritualized 
lack of rites and passage, lacking qualities of traditional wisdom culture. So reflecting on that role of saga of the community, I learned to pass to add it who is a chapter leader of the Israeli Satellite Society, a, a group that I was a founding um, member of. And I would reflect on the role of community and also the role of harm reduction in our community, on the community level, but those of us who are already exploring the, the plan. Thank you, Mel, and to the amazing panelists and the audience. Um, I do... Well, just acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that we're all meeting on today and sharing a story on. And I also want to acknowledge the people who have lost their lives to the war on drugs and the strength and resilience of the people with lived and living experience of drug use. It's not easy to use drugs in our society, um, which is why I find the community to be so important. Um, one of the main things that I find is like, it's a space where people will speak the same language. There isn't shame, there isn't fear or stigma. Some people might bring that in, and obviously I've also got my own internalized stigma and shame from the world we've grown up in, but um, it's just a really beautiful place for people to come and share and be seen um, as a human. You know, like I'm not a researcher, I'm not a psychologist, I'm just a guy, I like to, I like to party. And um, yeah, drugs are fun as well. Like. They, obviously, I'm, I'm not trying to discredit the amazing research that what panelists are doing and how psychedelics can heal a lot of, you know, dark things and bring bring up dark things to, to be healed, yeah. Um, but there's a lot of fun to be out in these drugs and I think that that is something that needs to, yeah, become more normalised, you know, like... Most people at this door are probably doing drugs. Like a little spoon is around everyone's neck, so I want to eat tiny bowls of cereal. Like we're all, <laughs> we're all doing drugs. Um, and that's okay, because drugs are not bad. Drugs are not good or bad. Um, the way that we use them might be problematic, um, but drugs don't have morality. Um, so the community is a place where, again, people can come and yeah, share and have like-minded, feelings like this is community right now you know like we're all here because we want to listen to this stuff and learn we're all in the same kind of vibe and it's a safe place to share um the reason why i kind of wanted to find community was a main a main thing actually i had a i accidentally ate a gummy bear of lsd when i was 21 with a seven-year-old we both didn't know that there were there was lsd in this gummy bear and um i had a really fucking wild trip um, didn't know I was tripping as well, but it completely changed my entire life. And then I was like, okay, what just happened? And then I found Mind Medicine Australia and another psychedelic organization and started volunteering with them. And there's a lot of you know, people volunteering in this space who have been touched by psychedelics and want to kind of work with them. Um, and then I also went to the EGA conference, Garden States, um, which was one of the most amazing conferences ever. Um, it was like a little doof. It was like, it's like when they're presenting research, but everyone, had, they're all doofers. And the, and the energy of it was beautiful. Like, I hope you don't mind saying, Martin, but um, when you were on stage with Mark Ross talking about the end of life psilocybin trials and you broke down in tears and spoke to Mark about it, like, I, the whole crowd was in tears. And it's so beautiful to see leaders in the space who have vulnerability and who have clearly, you know, potentially, you know, been in the environment, seen what the beauty and wonders of psychedelics can do and like are in touch with themselves. And there's not that, that coldness that a lot of the scientific community do have. And that's something that the psychedelic community does have is that warmth and that magic, I don't know how else to say it, um, that it's so attractive to come to, um, which can also be dangerous because it can bring a lot of people who look for like shiny objects and you know, a lot of narcissistic traits and people in that. Um, that's actually, I think something that I, kind of found in it too like I recognized through using acid that I have my own narcissistic part and I was drawn to the psychedelic world because of it because it was really shiny and cool it's like psychedelics oh yeah um, and I had a really difficult experience with LSD because of that and it kind of showed me um, yeah it, it was a long dark integration but it was it was good in the end and so I've kind of experienced in my life, you know, the good and the bad, and I'm really interested in providing a safe space 
um, for people to take drugs. Um, and that's kind of where the principle of harm reduction comes into. And for those who don't know, harm reduction is a concept that kind of takes its roots in feminist ideology and like body autonomy. And, you know, this is our body, our consciousness, we can do whatever the fuck we want with it. And, um, you know, we're allowed to do harm to ourselves and drugs can be harmful. Um, there is inherent risk with any drug, with anything, like anything in the right dose is poison, um, you know. So people who also come to the APS, they might not have had a psychedelic before, um, but they might be dealing with their own addictions. Like there are people who come with um, disordered eating habits, like overeating or under eating, and they're just struggling and really want to try MDMA therapy, don't have enough money. So they go to one, you know, underground therapist who hasn't done training. This is, it literally has a fucking like pig. Um, where do you keep pigs? What's that called? Something like a site. Yeah, a pen, like, literally like a pig pen on the back of their phone when they do MDMA sessions there. And this woman had to get a second mortgage on a fucking house to go and do MDMA therapy in a pig pen with an untrained therapist um, because it's so inaccessible and it's really sad. It's really, really scary and sad. Like had people come in, um, one woman came in with her son who was 16 and he wanted to take his own life. And the mom was just saying like, I don't want my son to die. Like I really want to offer him like some medicine that it can help him, but obviously he can't take it. Uh, because it's underage, and it was illegal. Um, so it's just this space where anyone who comes in can hold and, and be seen, see and be seen, and not just for psychedelics as well, like all drugs, like one of the main things of the APS is for decriminalization of all drugs, um, because it just doesn't work, obviously, you know, like prohibition doesn't work. Um, and I think, as I already said, like it's starting to, starting to learn that. Um, but yeah, so the role of community and all that is so important and special and that's why I fucking love it and that's why I wanted to be here and I'm so grateful you guys are here as well. So yeah, thanks for coming down. I'm just going to add one little part to the harm reduction side of things. So I guess um, we all, many of us know psychedelics definitely help us break down barriers, bring us together, connect, reconnect with nature. And, and also kind of, you know, we really, as humans, we really like to skill ourselves up. If we have a, an experience with something or we read about something we think is helpful, we kind of do a deep dive. And I think coming to that and looking at community, this is where like harm reduction and what DanceWise is doing is absolutely amazing. What these organizations are doing is absolutely amazing. But the biggest backbone of it all is that we're not really gonna let people tell us they're the experts unless they've actually, you know, done the substances taking a deep dive. So essentially harm reduction and what EGA does with harm reduction resources is we're not gonna, we find, well, who's the best person to ID psychedelic mushrooms? Probably the guy that's done it for 35 years and also is a chemist or is also uh, a mycologist. So harm reduction in many ways, it, the education side is taking experts from the community and then allowing them to bring those resources forward. So EGA will have ID guides. We're not trying to encourage people to take mushrooms, but we're trying to help people get educated so they don't get poisoned. Of course, they can go back and pick those mushrooms. That's a personal decision. But our, our thing is we want to create expert resources to help guide people with proper information to make informed self-consenting decisions uh, and definitely not get poisoned while they're there. Um, and so there's many different resources that EGA has and other um, like obviously DanceWise, the APS, but essentially it's about bringing community knowledge forward to take, uh, to, to share with each other to make sure we can make informed and good educated decisions, especially around safety. Um, one thing I will say is that in the cannabis community, when cannabis became kind of like legalized or whatever you'd call it now, Basically, they kind of said, well, if you've got a criminal record in cannabis, you can't actually participate in growing these cannabis or being the experts to help inform the community. So there's this break with the, the community that has the knowledge, they might not have every bit of the knowledge, but they certainly have a lot of it and they should be considered as experts. But these experts with, um, I guess, a lot of what's happening with the medicalization often get like siloed and, and not only that, they get picked on, harassed, arrested. So we're taking the community that has spent it's like decades training up to be experts and then we're pushing them out of the conversation and then we're handing it over to the big farmer. 
So of course there's gray areas there, but we just need to be really careful going forward. And also definitely community experts should be the ones speaking for us. Ding, ding. Yeah. So that's a really important point. Two places I want to go from there. One is how can I use this knowledge of tribute? But first, I want to just explore, touching what Adam said, this idea of, and what you said there, this idea of elitism in this group emerging in the field, of psychedelic elitism as well, also the concept of spiritual bypassing, basically the risks of the shadow emerging in our culture, in this field. And what can we, what, 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 is, what is this phenomenon and what can we do to manage it and hold it? All yours. Um, I guess I just want to acknowledge the psychedelic practitioners out there that have registration with ARFRA, that are in the medical field, that do have lived experience of psychedelics and how rare it is to talk to them talk about their personal experience with psychedelics, something I do a lot of. Um, and also there's backlash to that because our culture, our medical culture, is not used to hearing professionals talk about their own ego deaths, their own, you know, difficult experience with a psychedelic organisation. And there can be a really tense culture of, you know, we don't do that, we're blurring boundaries. But psychedelics is all about blurring boundaries for how do we do that uh, safely and in a conscious way. And, you know, Melissa, you're talking about shadow and I think when I, when I reflect on the last six years that I've been in the field is the elevation of these medicines. So we have obviously a thriving, booming underground culture that is, you know, had foundational roots that is, you know, stabilised in some sense and has been here um, forever. But then we have the medical context where we've got, um, you know, new practitioners that are taking psychedelics, that are, that are elevated, that may not be aware that they're going through their own trauma while they're designing a trial or supervising students or positioning themselves as a leader. Or, or working with other leaders and not knowing how to identify blind spots and existential, um, I guess, vulnerabilities. So, you now how do we work with the shadow? I think it's through through community of being accountable, and that's why um, AMAP's really passionate about being transparent and accountable, having really uncomfortable conversations, which we have with any leaders and and practitioners calling each other out, hopefully, without shame on our behaviour. When I entered the space, there was, um, I think, a lot of shame because of bad actors in the space and people who were caught up with those bad actors. And I saw how quickly shame in the psychedelic space can be such a dark, insidious player. And, you know, my hope for this, this field is that we can grow these leaders that can call each other out, but also have that door open for wide counsel for reflection and we can train our therapists to be aware of spiritual bypassing and, and narcissism and how to detect it in ourselves, in others, in our, in our clients, in leaders, and, and a lot of training and development because as we know this work, you know, it's, it's always evolving. Just when you think you've arrived, you know, you take another dose and then a next chapter of your life unfolds and, and that's happening in our organisations, in our research labs with our leaders, with our clients. And so I think it's a very unique uh, time for the mental health sector, this period of elevation, uh, expanding and contracting uh, the light and the shadow. And, you know, how do we hold it? And it's through yeah, tra transparency, accountability, and and friendships and and healing, healing ruptures of the community and knowing, knowing boundaries, or knowing when to hold a boundary with certain players, organisations, but also knowing how to um, yeah, meet, meet as wise counsel and sort our stuff out, out together. Yeah, thanks, Simon. I just wanted to add a little bit to that, um, to sort of tell you a bit about how it's sort of, the, the ego inflation effects that psychedelics can have, how that might actually spill into the scientific setting. And, you know, while you're, when taking the scientific approach, we're really aspiring to have objective perspectives, you know, in the search of truth. Um, sadly, a lot of, you know, people who research psychedelics, you know, they also 
you know, have done psychedelics themselves and they may have their own sort of personal insight. Either benefits their own career or is part of, you know, making profit for themselves or a company that they are part of. So for me, a real challenge of, you know, studying the, the positive effects of psychedelics in emerging adult development is that, well, you know, are they, how biased are some of these studies that are maybe more just focused on positive outcomes and there's much less profit incentives to actually look at adverse effects. There's not as much you know, benefit to companies, for example, or practitioners so much in looking at long-term negative outcomes from psychedelics. And I think that's why we currently don't have very much scientific research on you know, the ego infl inflating effects on psychedelics. We don't have much on, you know, the, the phenomenon of spiritual bypassing. There is some literature on, you know, spiritual emergencies, but not that much, you know, psychedelic induced spiritual emergencies specifically. Yeah, it's worth to add, add that least, yeah. And this is you a little bit there. How can those with knowledge, with experience, with lived experience contribute to the field right now? What are some of the ways people here, for example, could get involved? Um, well, I guess because I'm quite involved in the research space, then this is probably the, that's the most obvious connection I can, I can be sort of associated with, I guess. Um, one thing I do have to say for all that is that um, although there's plenty of space for volunteers and interns, the actual number of paid positions in research are, are very small. And I think we're going to find that the, the number of paid positions in as this is all translated or rolled out into clinical practice will also remain pretty small. So as always, as with all things to do with psychedelics, I think expectation management is paramount. And so I'm trying to manage expectations. Um, but all that said, I think there is scope for people to become more aware of what's going on in the research and the clinical and the medical space, but also um, find ways to bring that back to the community and to um, uh, really to share knowledge and wisdom so that uh, we don't, in some ways, we don't need the medicalization. We don't need the medical field for anything other than perhaps people who are really experiencing some, some, some significant problems. Um, and even then, it's hard to say whether psychedelic-assisted therapies are going to be the one answer. Uh, we do, again, in, in terms of expectation management, have to, um, we all have to acknowledge that, in fact, psychedelics are not going to be a silver bullet. They're not going to be the answer to all problems. Uh, and so I think we all have to have fairly realistic uh, expectations all, all that time. So I didn't exactly answer the question, but I, I can encourage people as much as they can to um, to communicate, to de to help to destigmatize, uh, and um, the more we have a conversation as a community, uh, then I think the better off we we all will be. Thanks, Martin. One direct way that you guys could help me is that you know if you are a man between thirty and thirty six who used psychedelics in your twenties and it had an impact on you, um, it'd be great for you to you know complete the survey that I'm doing to get that community knowledge um, into the, the research. I'd appreciate that. The survey isn't out yet, but when this um, recording gets released, I will um, put it in the comment section and PRISM will also publish it in their newsletter for people to read. So, older men, I'm sorry, Andrew, I don't have something for you there, mate, but maybe next, another study. Um, I'd say uh, adding to how can you get involved, well, one thing is just like if you're a doctor, if you're practicing in the field, like please educate your peers. If you've got mum and dad, talk to mum and dad because start with mum and dad and the rest of the family because change starts there. But for us, like uh, as EGA as an educational body, if you if you're like feel that you are one of these experts and you'd like to work with us to create a resource that would help the community and would reach out to us, sign up on our newsletter. Um, we have a, we're predominantly volunteers, but we're quite happy to peer work with you to develop a resource that will help the community. So if you have been studying some wild mushroom or some plant, or you've figured out some extract and you want to sort of help people reach out to us and we have a team we'll help we'll work with you to get that resource out and I would encourage everyone here to sign up to the EGA newsletter the APS newsletter the PRISM newsletter the AMAP newsletter 
every other newsletter that the community people here have. And I'd also say there's another way to get involved, and no one really likes to talk about it, but honestly, if you can support with a donation, that really helps. And some of these, um, what, what, what happens in the corporate world with $1,000, these organizations will do tenfold with that. We're all predominantly volunteers, and with even just a small donation, we can bring something to the community that actually has a real benefit. And there are, and I guess I'm going to be this guy, but uh, there are like tax deductible options to support some of the charities that are evolving in Australia because they're evolving to that level and they're being represented and understood to having a real benefit. So I, I, I'm not saying you have to e donate to EGA, but I, I encourage you to support the community itself because we can do a lot to help you. I was going to add to that as well. Uh, touching on what you said about um, telling your family and, and friends and stuff, like coming out of the psychedelic closet is like a thing, and like telling people that are close to you that you're a drug user is is a big step, and then um, it's something that everyone can do um, to like you know be the change you want to see. And also, I just want to acknowledge Lani, like your um, being out as a professional um, with your use is really brave and courageous, and I hope that more professionals take. Yeah, it takes try to do that as well, for sure. What's it? What would um, To get involved in the community as well, yeah. Um, a lot of the people like who get involved are volunteers, um, but coming down to yeah, one of the organisations, um, APS, for instance, we meet monthly in Brunswick on Victoria Street, and you know, we have some food and snacks and stuff. We've been doing... Um, other kinds of extra events, like we've been, we recently went to Melbourne Uni and did a talk with young people, uni students, about how to take psychedelics safely. And that's something that's really um, close to my heart, is working with vulnerable young people to teach them how to use drugs safely. Um, and there's also heaps of other stuff, like we run cannabis yoga, um, we run bushwalks, um, all kinds of stuff like that. So if you do have a skill and you feel like that's involved in a community, just like put your hand up and yeah, you might not get paid, but like, I guess, what is, your, what is the intention that you want to get involved with the secular community? Then if you don't want to get paid, that's fine, like get paid. Um, but there's also other things that you can bring as well. So, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking another thing that you could do is, I don't know, if you've had psychedelics and you, you've been, you had some insights for it or it's rocked you a little bit. And if you've got a therapist, tell them, don't be afraid to tell them. They need to know that you know, you're doing it and you may be able to, you know, maximize the effects of your psychedelic experience by being transparent with them and also maybe be able to manage and ground any potential negative effects. And I think the more that therapists can be aware that there is this sort of naturalistic use that's going on, that will just enhance the overall knowledge base between therapists. So I think that would be a great way to you know, get the word out there by coming out of the psychedelic closet to them. Um, yeah, we also mentioned um, DanceWise is doing a lot of great work. They're another organization that you might want to volunteer with, um, doing a lot of, you know, putting out amazing information about drugs and how to use them safely. So that could be another way to get involved. Also getting a free ticket to festivals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I also restate a few points there just on that sharing knowledge, so like that's definitely been a really beneficial thing. My friends, like you could be able to do that. So learning, learning is what this thing can add about how to hold space for your friends, for yourself, cultivating these practices like meditation, discernment, knowledge about your body, and sharing that with family and friends that can be the responsible bearers of these powerful tools. And also, also this group volunteering for prison. We have a big group of volunteers, and it's a lovely little community that we have. Things like social media events, and yep. I will also say as well, just to also one of I'm touching on the, the kind of blend of fun with therapy. One of the projects I'm working on is creating virtual reality systems to help prepare people for and also integrate you can cycle like experience these. This came from a history of mine being a vivid gamer as a teenager and perhaps me too much the time playing games. Hey, I learned so much for all these two pieces of realization. 
But I also realized I spent so much time um, kind of escaping my life in a way. Yeah, playing my fantasy bell made character. She's still with me today. She kind of really spooks up and having a tough time on psychedelics helps me get through get get through it. So I break off of that. But what is the game is what actually helped me develop my tools of discernment, my medical vision, my mindfulness, my mindset. If that's what we're seeking to do, we're going to run some events coming up where you can try the virtual reality experience. So definitely follow along Prism and also Paths, which is going to stand for a psychedelic art and technology and health science. So blending together the art, the wisdom, and the science with some gamified um, series. So look out for that. And with that, I'd like to pass for audience a question. So if you can come up here. Yeah, well, I, I would say to that, I, you know, just find some variables that you're interested in that, you know, in the previous research might suggest that there's some relationship with and maybe try to look for a particular demographic that, you know, those variables haven't been particularly studied in. And yeah, I think, you know, you could very much do some, you know, cross-sectional research, getting, you know, a couple of hundred participants and just looking at the correlations um, between those variables, I think would suffice as a um, worthwhile, honest project that could contribute to the literature. I'd also say that, you know, if you are connected to any clinical trials that are ongoing, they may be able to sort of cut out um, a particular couple of variables for you to look at in specific. Um, yeah. Martin was actually part of my, you know, how I got into my PhD research was you know, pushing me in the right um, direction with the right researchers being like, hey, they're doing this study, you can you can be involved in that. And that's that's how it worked out for me. So yeah. It, we, yeah. I'll, maybe we can have a chat later and see where you're studying. Yeah. I'll also say that Martin and I's emails are really easy. Melissa or Martin at prison.org.au. We can also find it on the website if there is that kind of question in terms of being involved directly in the research. So I'm going to have to say that um, making contact with supervisors, research supervisors who are already interested in and involved in the field would be a good way to go. Um, I came in quite a while ago, along with I'd care to mention, um, with, a, with a bright idea for a project uh, at Uni of Melbourne, and essentially people just laughed at me. And that was in 2004. <laughs> I don't think psychedelic research was even a thing in Australia at all at that time. So. Um, it really helps, uh, given that now that there's, there's a huge sort of increase in interest recently among the academic fraternity, it's no longer considered career suicide for mm -hmm. people to consider studying, uh, researching psychedelics. Um, so yeah, get in touch with the researchers at a number of different institutions in whichever capital city you happen to be in, and uh, and then you can follow up and there, there's almost certain to be something something going on. But yeah, PRISM is definitely a good, a good start. Can I say just one thing? Oh, yep. um, at the quick read? Um, yeah, it, you, you know, you're interested in studying at Swinburne, doing your um, honours thesis online, um, supervising students. So if you want to do that next year, I'd be happy to take you, man. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'll say. I would say, don't, don't forget co-production and co-design. It might not be um, a flavour of, you know, the monthly psychedelics when we're focused on bees, really, and, you know, incredible potential data, um, quantitative data, but qualitative uh, studies with people with lived experience where you actually design the methodology with the psychedelic community or, you know, that, that distinct group might be someone, you know, group with autism that takes psychedelics or Indigenous that takes psychedelics. So I think we need to really make sure that, yeah, um, those, those projects are included in the, the co-production, co-design. I guess as an ethnobotanist, uh, I'd probably say like building a relationship with the sacrament. So growing your own plant is absolutely fundamental. Uh, you know, that relationship you build up with that plant all the way through is, is going to rub off of you and the plant itself. So human and plant relationships, as we all know, are huge here. Uh, so fundamentally, I'd say build a relationship and at least get yourself as aware as you can and know as much about the sacrament before you use it. 
Um, and as far as just like a general trip sitting tip, because that's how I thought you were going to go, I just say like hang out with people you love, good, bad, and ugly, and then don't and move the other people out of the system. Get rid of them and just trip with the people you love and care about. Um, and that's not what you're asking, but I love and care for my plants, so they, they can come on for the trip with me. Um, I would say have an understanding of your attachment style. So without sounding too Croydian, you know, what was your family's map that was given to you during zero to 10 and onwards and your parts in relation to that? Are you anxious, avoidant, dis, you know, disorganised? I know that sounds really clinical, but what can happen in medicines and then ripples out through the communities if you haven't faced that and can see that shadow or that developmental wound it just keeps being amplified in the medicine and, and through your friendships and relationships and and also your relationship with the universe and how safe you feel existentially and that often starts from being amateur safe in your body in your ecosystem and then you know the larger mystery the I'll just keep it sort of brief since it's... Yeah, yeah. It, for me, it's around an intention of use, really giving a lot of space, you know, giving it a few days, giving yourself, you know, a full day of prepara preparation, setting out your intention, doing it, you know, in a safe setting with minimal distractions, big emphasis on going in and giving it a couple of days afterwards to really consider what happened and reflect on that. Yeah. I've, um, I've got a very strong sense of novelty and so I like experiencing new things. But as a, it's been drummed into me as a sort of a, a, a researcher as well, if you're going to explore new places and things, just change one thing at a time, not try and change too many things. So if you're in a new environment, stick with something that you know already as a substance. If you're going to try a new substance, then you, can, uh, then you really should be in a very familiar environment. Mm. Um, as someone, uh, well, don't ask me how and why I know, but um, yeah, it's not a great idea to try and mix up too many things along the way. Yep. Uh, I'd say being very careful with who you share it with after, who you tell your story to, because a lot of the time it can be really still, still valuable and fragile, and it can really hurt if someone tells you that um, you're talking shit or you're just tripping or you're hallucinating. It's like, no, nah, like this is a really important experience for me. It's like, can you please respect it? So yeah, be careful with who you share the story with, yeah. Oh, this, uh, one little last one. I always choose three what I call treasures before a journey. These treasures are a value, a mindset, that will carry me to learn about or reflect on. For example, my treasures for the festival are play, but also consistency, I want to get some sleep, and courage. So you're stepping up, having that conversation, opening, in new ways inside myself. And the last thing I'll say from my teacher, who I, uh, my, my fiction teacher, where I received for treatment of the Tibetan book we did, is letting go is not giving up. So we may not go around either. We may let go of the way we're holding something is causing us pain in that moment, but it's not giving up. So you can decide to like, let's let go together, let's let go of our expectations and together align with our attention. Mm, well said. Yeah. Where can we find us, I guess? You want to do that? Or where can they find us? Oh, so where can you find us? Prism, EGA, Facebook, Instagram, social media, um, Signs of Life, APS, AMAT, PARDS. <laughs> also, Dan's why it's a bit of info. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, sample symbols. Thank you, everybody.